really. Thank you, Doug, and good afternoon and, and good morning as well to our colleagues from across the country. It really is my pleasure on behalf of CAFC and our competencies profile uh, steering committee to welcome you all to today's webinar. This is a very exciting event for CAFC in that this is the first um, fairly large focus group or consensus group that we are bringing our profile to. And I, I want to begin by stressing how important your participation is uh, in today's event and, and in, in, in subsequent uh, discussions that we will have uh, specific to our practitioner profile competencies. Um, I just wanted to put it into, um, let me go to the next slide, I just have to click right here. Don't I? Oh, on, oops, sorry. I just want to go to the um, next slide, which um, to bring to sort of set the stage a little bit and how our work in um, in developing our practitioner profile um, around uh, transport systems, in fact, really supports CAFC's mission and the work that we do on behalf of our members. As part of our strategic plan, CAFC is very proud of our mission in that we support our member organizations through education, research, quality improvement initiatives that we hope will enhance health service delivery for Canada's children and youth. All of CAFC's work is guided um, by our board of directors and really important for me to emphasize today are member organizations. And I mention that because in fact the work around our uh, competencies profile comes from a directive, if you will, or a mandate that was set by our members. And I'm going to um, provide just a wee bit of background on that in, in literally just a moment on the next slide. I wanted to put our competencies profile work into context and um, how in fact this work fits within CAFC's five strategic priorities and those are listed for you on, on this slide. Establishing programs and activities that address current and emerging child and youth health care priorities. And we certainly felt that the work that we've done within our competencies profile in fact um, addresses that, um, that priority. In addition, advocating for transforming health service delivery for children and youth in Canada, again, applies to this specific work and to this specific population. Connecting service providers and key stakeholders to realize shared child and youth health care goals also applies to this work, and very much the connecting of um, service providers, just as we're doing today on this webinar, is an example of that. Fostering research, emphasizing brokering knowledge, facilitating educational opportunities to enhance information exchange, really cross-cuts everything that CAFC does and really uh, exemplifies a tremendous commitment to all of our member organizations. And then finally, our fifth strategic priority, um, in, ensures that we're able to build capacity and enhance our organization's health to ensure that we can realize our goals and objectives and meet the needs of our member organizations. So just sort of setting, setting that stage for you, just to provide a little bit of background just before I introduce uh, Kate Mann to everyone, how did, how did this work begin? Again, I, I just a few moments ago, I mentioned that all of CAFC's work is guided truly by, um, and I use, I use the word mandate, that is provided to us by our member organizations. And this work around our competencies profile, interfacility, critical care, transport, in fact began at our 2008 annual meeting in Edmonton, where delegates identified the lack of and need for national standards or guidelines in pediatric transport, including models of, models of practice, certification, and education. From that mandate or from that discussion in 2009, 
or over the subsequent few months, we established a National Transport Systems Steering Committee. Many of our members are participating on today's webinar. And our steering committee is comprised of multidisciplinary experts from across the country that began together uh, to address this issue. The, the, the work really over the first year or so um, was really around developing the focus and what would bring the greatest bang to, to our community. And consensus was reached on developing standards for interfacility transport of critically ill, maternal, neonatal, and pediatric patients with focus on the following two themes. The practitioner profile, which is what we're very, very proud to present to you today. And then a work in progress at this point is specific to systems design, including equipment standards, process of who to contact, fielding calls, response time, medical transport, ambulances, ambulance advice, financial issues, etc. So that sort of sets, sets the stage for today's uh, webinar and also the work that CAPSI committed to facilitating throughout 2012 um, via a knowledge transfer translation strategy. So throughout the winter and spring of 2012, we are going to host a series of national, interprofessional, multidisciplinary, focus group webinars, and today is the inaugural. It's very important and, and has a very special meaning to welcome you all to, this, um, to this, this first webinar. In fact, because many of you participating were actually at the 2008 Transport Systems Symposium, it was your recommendation around the need for national standards and guidelines that really has driven this work, and, uh, and, and we're very grateful, A, for your participation in 08, your continued participation, and also for joining us today. We hope and believe that these webinars are going to provide some content experts from a variety of sectors an opportunity to provide critical feedback to these recommendations. This is an opportunity for me to stress that the document that you have access to through CAFC's Knowledge Exchange Network is in fact a draft. And now the very important process is bringing that draft and these recommendations to you, to our community across the country to gain your feedback. Um, and, uh, and of course, your feedback will be incorporated into the development of the final document. As it says here, upon completion of this national consultation process, we will finalize the competencies profile and work with our colleagues at Accreditation Canada to explore opportunities to bring some of these recommendations to a national accreditation uh, platform. This is, fact, in fact, just the introductory page of our transport competencies profile. And again, I'll bring your attention to the date being uh, December 21st, 2011. And again, this is our final draft that we are very much looking forward to, uh, to sharing with, uh, with you. Um, on today's um, webinar, this is sort of a, a brief overview or agenda of, of what we hope to cover and provide for you. And um, I'm going to introduce our, um, our speaker today, who is a colleague and, and expert in this field, Kate Mann. Uh, Kate is going to provide um, some background on the process and uh, work right up to today, future direction, and then engage us in a, in a dialogue on what we need from you, from our uh, content experts um, from, from across the country and helping us to develop these final recommendations as, uh, as, I, as I described in the previous slide. Without any further ado, it is my pleasure to welcome, as I mentioned, a colleague and, and a long-standing colleague, Kate Mann. Um, Kate is a registered nurse with over 25 years of leadership and management experience in the healthcare industry, including a national leadership role for professional practice as president of the Canadian Association of Critical Care Nurses. 
Kate has held progressive management positions with direct line authority and financial responsibility for diverse intraprofessional teams in a pediatric tertiary care institution. Kate has been actively involved in the evolution of pediatric neonatal and high-risk obstetrical air medical transport services in the Maritimes for more than 15 years in her past role as director at the IWK in Halifax, where she was directing, uh, directly accountable for the IWK RNs and RRTs on the EHS Life Flight team. Kate was part of the discussion and part of our uh, transport symposium in Edmonton in 2008 and has been an integral member of our national steering committee uh, since 2009. Kate, without any further ado, um, it, it is my pleasure, first of all, to thank you and recognize your leadership in the development of this work thus far and to, uh, to welcome you to today's webinar. Thank you, Elaine. Uh, no, it's nice to be here and participate in this webinar. And I say hello to all my colleagues across the country, and particularly those at the IWK. I, I'm really delighted to be able to share with you today um, the work that has been ongoing for the past couple of years, as Elaine has said. And now uh, that work has been to describe what I would call a minimum set of standards around the safe and competent transport of critically ill neonates pediatric patients and high-risk obstetrical patients. Interfacility uh, transport of critically ill high-risk uh, population that we've described in Canada is provided in a, a, a number of different ways in different parts of the country. And it's pretty obvious that it's evolved to be what it is for lots of reasons, uh, often influenced by local resources, geography, uh, the diversity of availability of aircraft or emergency health ambulance systems. So it, we're not judging it. It is different. That's what we knew. That's what we discovered as we began this journey of looking at this. However, um, there's also no consistency across the country as to the personnel who are involved or what they are expected to know and able to be to perform the kinds of competencies of the transport teams. And we know there are lots of different configurations of teams across the country. There are RN, RN teams, uh, paramedic, paramedic, paramedic only. There's sometimes physicians who will go on board. And of course, uh, you know, the model that I'm aware of the most is certainly uh, RN and RRT. So those are some of the configurations of the teams that we know exist across the country. And in some cases, we know that specialty teams with advanced levels of training are utilized, and in others, the transfer is done by ad hoc teams with variable levels of competencies. And everyone is providing the best that they can, but there is a great difference, a variation in the level of care that can be provided by uh, a specialty trained and organized team and infrastructure versus what finding someone to jump on the back of an ambulance or go in the aircraft at a moment's a moment in time and to respond to a patient's need, uh, often scrambling to find the right vehicle to transport them in and the right equipment to have to do it. And we know, for those of us that have worked in this field for a long time, that uh, children, neonates, and high-risk obstetric patients uh, require a very specialized kind of care and equipment to go with it. So the work that we've been doing as the two working groups over the last couple of years are looking at all those variables and trying to determine what is the minimum kind of thing that should be available if you're in this business to focus on what are the needs of the patients. So as Elaine mentioned, uh, in 2008 in Edmonton, um, a group of us about 75 of us were in the room that day uh, listening to a presentation and got into the discussion. And of course, Elaine was sitting in the back of the room. I still remember that over my left shoulder. And as we identified that there, there was a lack of and a need for national standards and guidelines in for neonatal, pediatric, and high-risk maternal transport, uh, Elaine said, we're going to do it. And if you know Elaine, you know that once she says that, it will get done. 
And so from the, that first discussion in a, a breakout room in Edmonton, we have come together across the country sharing a lot of expertise that we have in the various programs in order to come up with uh, some of the minimum standards that we want to share with you today. So from that Edmonton meeting in June 2010 in Vancouver, in fact, the National Transportation Systems Working Group uh, refined and defined their goal, and it became to develop standards for interfacility transport of critically ill newborns, children, and youth. And you can see that we have that asterisk because after that definition was made, and probably because of the experience both in British Columbia as well as in Nova Scotia where high-risk obstetrical transport is done, we knew that um, we needed to add, uh, add competencies around transport for high-risk maternal transport because those of us that are in the business, it is recognized that the best transport vehicle is the human incubator and uh, the results speak for themselves in the programs that are doing that. So uh, with the focus on the two themes, um, the practitioner profile, so the practitioner profile, which is what we're talking about today, is focusing on who is actually doing the transport and what kind of skills, training, knowledge, and competencies should they bring to it and uh, acquire as they are in, in this business. And the other part is the system design, and that is looking at all the infrastructure that goes with uh, a program if you're in the business of air medical transport to include all the things like equipment, uh, communication, the re kind of response times, responsiveness of the program, and the kind of advice that should be available and given, and of course looking at the financial issues that go along with that. So how did we go about it? Well, the process that we used is we looked at the existing models and practices. We knew we wanted to know what we currently have and what we currently know. So we wanted to share experience across the country. So we did. We shared that collective wisdom of many of the programs across the country and had lots of lively discussions uh, online about, about what we were doing in the various uh, pro provinces where air medical transport was provided for this population. And we had the opportunity to cherry pick the best of the best. So we looked at what were the great successes that were in each program, uh, what people felt proud about, what they felt good about, and by having those kinds of open discussions, we were able to look at selecting the best of the best as we went through this process. The goal, of course, was to recommend national standards, which is a minimum set of expectations, knowing that many programs probably already set and achieve even higher standards than that. But what we are looking at is, again, if you're going to be in this business, what is the minimum set of standards that you should be able to, to meet? We wanted to consult with multiple stakeholders, so again, the working groups are working up documents, uh, having lots of thoughtful discussions based on our experience in the system, and we knew at a point in time we needed to bring it out to a broader audience, and thus today why we've begun this series of webinars to begin to access the stakeholders who have a lot of content expertise, probably a lot of people in the audience who are actually the people who jump on to the back of ambulances, and I, I shouldn't say jump, you, you thoughtfully get into those and uh, approach them, and uh, or onto the aircraft, and it's that expertise uh, that we want to have eyes on this document now to give us the opportunity to revise it before it becomes a fait accompli, because it certainly is, we don't see it as a fait accompli at, at this uh, stage. So uh, we want to make that document more visible, um, and we know from uh, that, it's, that it's been um, accessed, accessed on the Knowledge Exchange Network uh, more than 300 times. So we know people are, are grabbing it at the moment, and that is really uh, good news to us. We want to pilot it for, for feasibility. The question is, 
do you see your program being able to use this? Is it a useful document? Is it a practical document? Um, is it something that you would see that could be embedded into your program as, uh, to use? So we want to know that. And of course we want to implement it at, uh, in the end. There are two separate working groups that were, were struck. The practitioner profile group, which is what we're talking to you about today. And then there's another group, which is, and I'm a member of the practitioner profile group, there is another group that is the system design group, and they're looking at the infrastructure uh, of a program, which I spoke about in terms of, of equipment, etc. Uh, an ambitious one-year work plan was uh, envisioned, I guess, in June in Vancouver, and we're we're not we're past the one-year mark, but we've we've been making thoughtful, good progress. Uh, still with our eyes on what the goal is at the end of this. So although we're a little past what we wanted to do, we're, we're going to get to the end. So on the practitioner profile group, uh, it consists of interprofessional representatives from across Canada, which include the disciplines that you see there on your, on your screen. And these are people that have worked in the system or been administrators over the system who have a lot of knowledge of what are some of the materials that exist, uh, some of the documentation that exists in the programs across the country, and we really tapped into the, their knowledge to look at, at uh, what we needed to come up with in our, in our final document, which it must have gone through about 10 drafts, to be honest, until we got to December 21st and we said, you know what, we could keep looking at this and looking at this, it's time to bring it out to a broader audience. And we began by comparing the current status in regions across the country and existing training programs and the competency list that people had already identified. We gathered a lot of electronic documents from programs to see what the programs themselves had said were important for their team members to be competent in. So we used a lot of that um, information and you will see that reference in the profile document itself. However, we had to start somewhere and we chose to start with the British Columbia Infant Transport Team competencies document um, and we used that document uh, and discussed it extensively. Uh, I would say what we ended up with now little resembles that document as we made so many additions and deletions and we revised it based on what we had gathered across the country and as our knowledge increased about what was in some of the other documents that we received from programs. The content experts reviewed the list of competencies to determine their relevance for the population that we're talking about and we did a, insert a lot of additional competencies where we thought they needed to be uh, further defined um, or uh, added to that document. So what we produced uh, many drafts later, we landed on the current document that is the one that you can access. And I would encourage you, if you have not seen it yet, that we really need your eyes on that document because we need that kind of feedback. And Today's webinar is not going to be conducive to the wordsmithing of it. We're looking for very, you know, what is missing from that. I'm going to talk about that a little bit more um, when we uh, bring up the document. So the current document describes the competencies that the working group feels are essential to the combined set of practitioners. Oops, sorry, I got ahead of myself here. Um, and. Uh, performing critical care or high-risk intrafacility transport of maternal, neonatal, and pediatric patient. And what is important to note is although I think when we first started we said what are the competencies that may be needed and we thought oh we know all the team configurations across the country, do we need to describe what paramedics should be able to do and registered respiratory therapists and RN should do and we came up with uh, if we did that we'd be <laughs> very extensive number one. But we, it was important to understand that a team is a team and it's the combined skills that the team brings to the care of the patient that needs to be there. So we didn't focus on that each individual has to have the skills, but that together the involved practitioner should have a complete set. So truly bringing about that the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. 
So what kinds of transports are we talking about? We're talking about the high-end level of transports. We're talking about the stabilization and safe interfacility transport, whether it's by air or ground, of that unstable, acute, critically ill, and high-risk maternal, neonatal, and pediatric uh, patient population. These standards are not intended for the routine, stable patient transport that may happen between hospitals for a procedure. We're talking about going out for their really sick patients. So we defined that. What are the uh, really sick patients that we're going for? And this is the description that we came up with, that they are the unstable neonatal and pediatric patients and they would be classified with the following that they have potential for or compromised airway, experiencing respiratory distress or failure, and or maybe requiring assistive ventilation and support. They could have cardiovascular instability and a need for cardiovascular support, could be altered levels of consciousness, they could be low birth weight and extremely low birth weight preterm neonate or trauma patients in the pediatric population. So again, you can see that we're not talking about the ones that uh, need to have a Band-Aid put on. We're talking about uh, life-threatening uh, life kind of illness uh, that needs transport to a higher level of care from wherever they're being picked up from. And in the maternal population, we're looking at uh, the threatened preterm labor and or the high-risk maternal conditions that require, again, transport from, to a higher level of care. So what you will see, in, um, if any of you have them there, you'll see that there are seven categories of competencies that we define. And I'm just going to briefly run down each one because the document is quite extensive in um, articulating what is under each of these, but I'll just give you some examples of what's in, within each. So under professional responsibilities, we're talking about things like accountability for personal um, and professional development plans. We're talking about functioning within relevant legislation and policies and procedures and organizational uh, policies. We're talking about being an effective team player within the transport environment and demonstrating effective decision making. Under communication, we're talking about um, communication within, with the patient, of course, um, the family, within the team. Uh, within how the team uh, communicates with the referring facilities and the personnel that would be within them, and even how the team communicates with the media that's consistent with organizational policies. It's about documentation. It's about the trust and rapport with patients and colleagues, having effective interpersonal communication skills, displaying tact, diplomacy, and being able to have successful conflict resolution. Under the health and safety competencies, we're talking about being responsible for maintaining your own physical and mental fitness that is consistent with requirements in the transport environment, things like being able to uh, physically able to lift, being responsible for maintaining a safe work environment, even being able to work in confined spaces, because we know backs of ambulances and backs of helicopters and airplanes, uh, you have to be able to maneuver in those environments. So you do need to uh, take into consideration those, the things within this section described, things like meeting the height and weight requirements for the type and configuration of aircraft that each program uses. Under assessment and diagnostics, uh, this is uh, talking about um, the physical assessment and interpretation of findings. It's divided into systems approach, CD, neuro, respiratory, GIGU, all those kinds of things where it's further subdivided. It's really, in this section, it's what knowledge is needed to be known um, about about transporting this patient population. So it's in a lot of detail, and we had a lot of discussion at our group on how to be best present this section, because 
every time we looked at it, we'd say, oh, but you should include this, or if you're including that, or why did you name this if you didn't name that? So when you're looking at that document and you have that kind of content expertise, uh, think about that. What, what would make sense on that? We're not saying that it is in totally uh, exclusive list, and I think we pre the preamble certainly says that it, it is not intended to be, these are the only things you have to know, but we were trying to list the kinds of things that you would have to know, and we also understood that not all programs would, uh, so for instance, if you were only transporting neonates, then the competencies that relate to neonates would, would be what you would pick out for your program. If you were not doing maternal high-risk transport, then obviously the competencies that are listed in this section wouldn't be something that your program would have to take on. But we wanted to have a document that reflected the full range of those competencies and people would pick what they needed out of them. So lots of attention is needed, eyes on, in that section. In the therapeutic section, this is about the skills, what you need to be able to do the job, what you need to, this is the how-to, um, how do you perform those kinds of things. So you need to demonstrate, what kinds of things you need to demonstrate proficiency. It's things like how, what equipment that you should be uh, able to use, what kind of procedures you should be able to demonstrate. It goes into the kinds of certifications that the, t the uh, team should have, things like PALS, ATS, STABLE, ACORN, you know, uh, those are the kinds of things that are listed in, in that, that section there. So I call that the, the how-to section. In the integration section, it's really about using all your skills, all your knowledge to decide on a best plan of care. It's about how you establish priorities, communicating effectively to medical control physicians. It's the confidence that you need in decision making and action. And, you know, even providing developmentally appropriate care, patient and family centered, being attuned with cultural and spiritual competencies. Those are the kinds of things that are talking about how do you integrate it all together uh, when you need to. And in transportation, that section um, is looking at the familiarity you have in maintenance of equipment, the kinds of checks you need, need to be able to do. It's about keeping patients safe when they're in transport and ground or air. It's about keeping yourself safe um, as you work in that kind of environment. And one of the things that I think it uh, really brings out is about um, um, decision to transport. So how do you put it all together when you have the knowledge, you have the skills, the ability to do what is needed for the patient, but how do you combine it? Combine it at a moment in time to make the best decision, knowing what the clinical priorities for care are in combination with the transport logistics that are within your program. So that is really speaking to knowing when it is best to stay in play versus snatch and run, knowing what vehicle you should perhaps recommend, and consideration of all of those factors. It's really about how expert the practitioners need to be when we really need you to be it. And besides being excellent clinicians, it's about putting it together and understanding the transport environment. and. Um, you know, that is, you'll see lots of things described in there uh, that uh, go into a bit more depth on that. So our goals going forward, uh, this is the first stakeholder focus group webinar that we're doing, and there is a series of them being scheduled across the country, uh, tailored to various needs of, of uh, different stakeholder groups. So we're really pleased that we, we know that we've had uh, almost 100 people sign up today across the country, and I suspect there's more who have come into the rooms um, and are hearing this today. So our purpose is to really conduct this uh, stakeholder focus group, collecting your comments, your expert feedback to complete a finalized version of the transport competencies profile. And what we want to do is use this profile to identify a set of the recommended standards for critical care, maternal, neonatal, and pediatric 
uh, transport for the practitioners that actually perform this. We have been in discussion, uh, when I say we, CAPC has certainly been in discussion with Accreditation Canada and as we know in the hospital environments that we work in, the role of Accreditation Canada is, as a not-for-profit independent organization, it provides healthcare organizations with an external peer review to assess the quality of their services based on standards of excellence. So Accreditation Canada is accredited by the International Society for Quality in Healthcare and has been fostering quality in health services across Canada and internationally since 1958. And we do know that currently there are no Canadian accrediting body for uh, specifically for air medical transport. Uh, some of the programs will access American accreditation processes uh, accrediting bodies to, to uh, uh, get that kind of uh, review. What we're hoping is that as we develop this um, partnership with Accreditation Canada that there may be a made in Canada solution for accreditation of, of air medical transport programs. That would be really exciting. So the future direction is certainly to work with Accreditation Canada to establish an identified set of the standards for the population that we're speaking about and that it could be supported through Accreditation Canada's survey or compliance review and accreditation processes. So slipping it into uh, an organization's approach to uh, measuring quality in programs and organizations is a future direction we hope that we can work towards. So, what we need from you. We know that you are the experts in maternal, neonatal, and pediatric care and interfacility transport. We really need to have the review of the draft document, um, the transport competencies profile, and maybe, uh, uh, Doug, you could bring that up for me now. Okay, so this, this is um, an overview of, the, of the, what the document looks like, the content of the document. So when you access it on the knowledge translation, there's the front page of it. When you access it on the uh, knowledge exchange network, it's called CAN, Knowledge Exchange Network. So when you know, uh, access it on CAN, you will get it. I believe it's about 51 pages long since it I actually did my printer in this morning, and um, the uh, the competencies so you can see them coming up here in the table of contents. I've spoken to each of the themes, the seven themes that there are, and under each of these general competencies within each theme, it's further subdivided. So there's a lot of information when you go through it uh, on here. So it is a fairly lengthy document. Maybe you just scroll down, dug into maybe the first um, theme to the, under the professional responsibilities. So here's an example on this first page you can see how it starts to break out. These are very general competencies in this section but uh, and some of them you'd say well yeah but these are things that we wanted to make sure were visible. Uh, when you get into some of the other themes you will certainly see the detail that we're talking about under each of the competencies. So we're not here today to actually uh, go through each of these sections because it would take a lot longer than what we have. Um, but this is the feedback that we need in each of these sections when you look at it. So I think then uh, we'll move on to the survey that we've developed where we hope will be a tool for you once you've looked at the competencies to actually go on um, and this is a survey monkey uh, survey that has uh, uh, been done. It is a very simple survey in the sense of we're asking you uh, are the identified competencies clear in their meaning? If you feel like as you read through them, yes they are um, in general, then you would just click that off. But if you are looking at say a section in your, you have something that you feel, you know, in section 7.3 I, I think it 
you know, you're missing, it should be stated this way. We want that kind of feedback and we also want to know when you have your eyes on it, is there something we've totally overlooked? Because it can certainly happen when you don't see the forest through the trees sometimes. So that's the kind of feedback we're looking at. The, although these boxes look narrow, they, you can keep writing and writing in them. So uh, you're not limited by the size of the box that you see there. So we're looking at, are the identified competencies clear in their meaning? Are they relative to include as part of the practitioner profile? So are they things that you're going, well, that you don't need to say that, or um, you know, they're real, that isn't really relevant to the uh, transport environment. And are there additional competencies that need to be included in the list? And I think I've said that, have we missed something? So if you're having a hard time identifying it, that's good, I guess, but we're very receptive if, if you find out that, uh, if you see something that we really do need. Uh, I think you need to scroll down now there, Doug. So on number four, um, and do you think this document will be useful in your practice um, in your air medical transport system? And of course, in the final one, we're just saying any suggestions for improvement. So, you know, we put a lot of energy looking at how to put this document together to land on what you see. And as I say, if you looked at our starting document, this final one doesn't really look um, much the same, although its origins are, are embedded in many of the documents that we reviewed across the country. But we are completely receptive to any suggestions for improvement that you see in that. We really want your input on that. So it is a very um, simple, we figured if we made it a lot longer, people wouldn't answer it. So we figured by keeping it minimal and you pick up the things that you think are important to highlight that we need to do and we're going to use this information when it's compiled to, to get together and look at it and say, look, um, we need to consider all of this feedback before we feel comfortable in calling it a final document. So I think that's it for the survey monkey. And at this stage, I'd like to you know thank everyone uh, for your participation. And I guess that the we're also on to uh, our final, which is uh, questions and and answers. And I'm not sure if any have come in to you, Doug. Um, I'm going to hand it back to Doug, who will be moderating if there are any questions that we have. Okay. Yeah. We well, we haven't had any questions uh, typed in yet, so we'll we'll just give, take this opportunity to remind people that uh, if you do have a question, uh, you know, feel free to type it into the box. We we also uh, we didn't have the the overwhelming number of people actually show up on the webinar that act, that, that registered. So we may um, want to take the opportunity to allow people to. Uh, to be unmuted and actually verbally make a comment or ask a question verbally. So uh, I think Elaine has a comment to make first, but while, uh, while she's doing that, we'll just get uh, people to um, you know, either type in their question or click the raise your hand button and we'll, we'll see if we can unmute uh, uh, people and, and, and give them an opportunity to ask a question. And if, if you are on the audio through your computer, uh, make sure, please make sure you have a microphone before you raise your hand. Okay. Thanks, Doug. I, so, just while we're while we're waiting to see if if we uh, if we have any questions from our participants and colleagues across the country, Kate, I, I just want to thank you. Um, I I just your your presentation was was so concise and really delivered the message on behalf of our practitioner profile working group and our national steering committee meeting. It uh, I, I think it tells a very important story again that represents a very broad membership and, and uh, child and youth health care community in, in our country. So on behalf of CAFC, Kate, and our National Steering Committee and our Practitioner Profile Group, thank you so much for, uh, for, uh, for your leadership today. Well, you're welcome, Elaine. It's, it's, uh, when you have a lot of passion about something like that, it's, it's uh, a delight to be able to speak to it. Good stuff. So we've had a few questions come in. Um, uh, I'll just, uh, somebody says uh, they don't have a microphone because of the cutbacks that they've experienced. But, <laughs> 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 but uh, hopefully not everything. <laughs> funny, but. 
Uh, but the first question that came in was about uh, were other standards used, and she gives the example of NAN, N-A-N-N. I'm not familiar with that acronym, but uh, Kate, perhaps you are. Um, yeah, so that's around the neonatal, and the answer would be yes. All of those things are have been drawn into. So yes, we looked at program standards, but we actually had some neonatal expertise on our committee who uh, drew from some of that kind of a, a background as well. And uh, you know, so I think you would see the flavor of it um, in the transport document. Maybe not the exact words, but where there were existing standards, we weren't trying to reinvent. Um, there's a, a number of questions about how uh, we're going to be following up with people, and just to, you know, um, Kate mentioned, well, described when we showed the, the survey. So we're going to be sending a, an email to all of the participants with uh, uh, links to the survey, with links to the actual document. Um, you can see the link on the slide that's up right now that takes us. Oh, just the slide takes us to the Knowledge Exchange Network here, the ken.cafc.org. You can search there under competencies are transported and we'll bring it up. It's in the other category that you'll see on the front page of the Knowledge Exchange Network. But we'll send everyone links to get them directly there so they don't have to search too far, as well as that link to the survey. Um, so we did, uh, and there's also a question about the timeline for the survey. So we'll leave the survey open for probably three weeks. We'll give uh, people uh, till basically till the end of, of, uh, of March uh, to complete the survey. And again, feel free to, I would suggest that people pass it around to their colleagues in their transport team or others in their hospital or department and uh, make sure that uh, what we'll and what we'll do is we've recorded this webinar we'll post it up on the uh, knowledge exchange network so people can can hear uh, Kate and Elaine's background on the project and their description of the work so they have some uh, context by which to uh, to go through the the, the profile and, and make their responses um, so we will again we'll send all that out by by email um, there's a few more questions coming in here. Um, so it says, uh, someone said, excellent work, Kate. Uh, thank you for taking the lead on this important topic. She's asking, can you help us to understand if there will be recommendations regarding the optimal staff mix for transport, or is the thinking that the competencies will help organizations dictate the most appropriate staff mix? That's a, a really insightful question I think um, I think one of the things we we don't want to do is be prescriptive about how a team is configured we know that they're configured for lots of good reasons uh, across the country differently and what we're trying to do is say no matter how you're configured you must be able to provide these competencies so it is a team composition and if those competencies can be met we're not saying um, it, it should be composed of a certain type of personnel whether it's RN, RN, RT um, or uh, paramedics. We know there is success in all of those but um, the, the answer is really uh, it is about the competencies, reaching those competencies as a team. And I hope that answers your question. Yeah, but I think I would agree. I mean, that's that's a topic that's come up many times in, in how to address the variation. Because when when we did the initial surveys of what the team compositions were across the country, it's as Kate said earlier, it was across the board different. And, and within some provinces, the neonatal team was was one com one mix, and the pediatric team was different. To, and and we wanted to create comp a competency set that that allowed that to continue to happen, but still ensured that as a team the competencies were met. Um, the next question was, uh, the questions are coming in so fast, they're scrolling off the uh, page here. So. <laughs> That's good. Uh, uh, it says, do most programs in Canada have a standard practice for also transporting a patient's parent or guardian? Hmm. Well, I, again, I'd say there's big variation in practice on that one. Um, a lot of time um, it is based on the ability to actually do that. Um, some, and of course there's always the uh, liability issues that the carrier has to consider. Um, I know uh, people are certainly considered a passenger um, on that, but I'm not particularly expert uh, in that. I can tell you that it is done um, at times um, and for an appropriate situation. Um, 
I can recall, for instance, uh, a transport when you wanted the mother to be present. It was an obstructed airway of a child, and that child came transported from about uh, an hour from here in Halifax. Uh, the mother was strapped to the uh, trans uh, transport stretcher holding her toddler who had swallowed some foreign object in order to keep that airway stable. So, you know, the teams become very um, uh, creative in how they do that. And there are times when it is most appropriate uh, to do that. But I would say the majority of the experience that we've seen is that it's just not possible for a lot of reasons. But it doesn't mean that it, it might not be the right thing at a moment in time. But those things have to be thoughtfully considered. Yeah, and while, and while this particular piece of work that we're discussing today is about the, comp the competencies of the practitioners that make up the team, that question might be more appropriately addressed by the systems design group. That's right. I, I think it is. Yeah, in identifying, you know, guidelines or recommendations about when it, you know, should be considered and when maybe not to be. But that's certainly an interesting point. And feel free to include that when you receive the survey link as something that, may, that we may want to consider. I think, I think it, it's such an important point and, and one that really had not been discussed in, in great detail uh, in the development of the profile thus far. So as Doug said, yes, please include that because that's going to be very helpful for us. So the next uh, question is, uh, they said that they haven't reviewed the document yet, but she's asking, how will it relate to those of us who do transport in remote areas where there are no specialty teams but generalists who have to do it all? That includes critical care transport of neonates, children, and high-risk obstetrics. Hmm. Um, I guess what we're saying is, you know, there. this is... Uh, a goal to work towards in terms of the minimum standards that we're expecting to do, to have in place if you have to transport. You can't create these the next day if you don't have them. They are something to work towards. And by defining them, I think what we're able to do is start to see where there are gaps in the system that create risk um, to patients. And, uh, you know, appreciating that there are some remote areas that aren't, aren't just about the north either um, that would face some of those challenges. I look at uh, some of the, you know, challenges in, in the outports of Newfoundland and where, you know, it is difficult to get aircraft in and, and uh, those kinds of things. Those are all the realities. So I wouldn't say, you know, we're going to come out and say this is it and tomorrow if you can't meet that, that, you know, that's, that's not, um, you're, you're failing. Elaine, what, what you might say about that? Yeah, no, I, 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 think, I think your response is absolutely correct, Kate, and I really referring back to what Doug had, had, um, had brought to the discussion a few minutes ago is we recognize that the makeup of the teams are so diverse across the country. They're diverse in our urban centers, they're diverse in our more remote, remote centers. So again, we're hoping that in working toward achieving this minimum set of, of competencies or this minimum sort of standards, if you will, that's going to provide what your team, if it's, if it's your team and the way that team is made up in, in a rural or remote area, um, again, it's the, it's the competencies themselves that we're now trying to focus on as opposed to dictating what your team must be made of. So I think it really applies across the board and is very relevant to this excellent question. All right, so we'll just move on to the uh, next question, keeping an eye on the time. I think we, uh, we, we said people, that we told people that this was going to be an hour-long uh, session, but we did schedule 90 minutes. Uh, we, we do have 90 minutes available for anyone who is able to stay past uh, 1 o'clock Eastern time time it is in your area. So we do have a number of other questions. We'll likely go a little bit over time, but again, as I mentioned earlier, this will be recorded and we'll put it up on, on the Knowledge Exchange Network. Um, so you'll be able to, uh, if you have to leave uh, at one o'clock, then, uh, then then please check out the Knowledge Exchange Network if you're interested in hearing how the rest of the uh, discussion ended. Um, so the next question was, is there any data on how the competencies of transport, of the transport team affects the morbidity, mortality, and and or data on the value of having a dedicated transport team for 
interfacility as as opposed to the ad hoc. Right. Um, I guess every program certainly uh, tracks their outcomes uh, in many different ways. Some have more sophisticated um, databases to look at that kind of stuff than others. Where there is that data, we will have the ability to do some comparison before and after, I guess, in terms of the competencies. So uh, something to definitely keep in mind to see, you know, by doing this, have we made a difference um, in, in uh, morbidity and mortality? Yeah, and that's, uh, I mean, that's uh, my, my assumption is that there's very little actual research that's been done on this, like at a, at a you know, on a, on a multi-center, sort of broad national scale. Um, but we have talked about that at the steering committee level. We've talked about encouraging more research in this area. We've talked about potential, one of the potential projects for the future is the establishing of a database to collect data that, we could, that research could be based on. Lots of things have been discussed, but obviously there's lots of work to be done in, that, in the area of research. And I, I do think, uh, Doug, you know, because we've gotten together as these groups of, of programs and people who have uh, uh, interests across the country, we are setting ourselves up for the ability to not be islands in sharing that kind of information. And we all know that when you're in the business of pediatric and neonatal uh, and maternal, it's a, a relatively um, small community. And so we should have the ability to be able to share the, the kind of uh, evidence that's coming out of our programs together and I think this is the beginning of that of that ability. I did get a comment coming from Laurel who said who's uh, suggested says, suggesting that there is literature to support trained dedicated teams and Laurel if you wouldn't mind sending that to uh, me by email that's my email address up there on the screen right now dmaynard at capc.org I'd be more than happy to pass those references around and perhaps even include them on the uh, page on the Knowledge Exchange Network where this, uh, where this presentation will be, because I think that would be very helpful for people to uh, have access to that. Um, she said, will do. All right. Thank you, Laurel. Um, she's also suggesting that, uh, she said, thanks for all of our work in, in taking this on at the national level, uh, suggesting that they've struggled in Ontario with this, but, but, seen, but have worked well together. Um, she says it's encouraging to take it to a national level so all transported patients have access to the best care. Well, I think we all agree with that uh, comment. Um, uh, Dorothy has uh, put in a couple of comments. I'm not sure if they're, if they're comments or questions. I'll just sort of read one. You might have a bit of a, a word missing that makes it a little grammatically difficult to uh, understand. But she's saying, what's the plan to initiate another transport team in New Brunswick? She says she was trained by New Brunswick Air Care years ago and would love to do more NICU transports. Uh, I don't think I could actually speak to that one. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm not sure what if she's asking a question of this group or, but uh, feel free to clarify, Dorothy, if you uh, if yeah, you have that, a chance. Yeah, that would be helpful. And she said Toronto Sick Kids did their training, and she said it was excellent. So that's, that's good. Um, Karen, who's actually left uh, the presentation, but I'll ask her a question anyways in case she's able to come back and listen to the recording. She's, she's, she also said thanks and said that this was a great presentation. But she said, what are the next steps in structuring the organization of transport in the, in the different provinces? Or is, is this document only for the accreditation of teams? Mm -hmm. Elaine? Yeah. All right. Yeah. All right. No, I, I, can, uh, I, I can sort of bring, um, bring CAFC's perspective to this. Of course, the the contribution that we're hoping as um, as a community um, and and CAFC again is facilitating this work, but the work is being led by some of our content experts from across the country. What we're hoping, as as is the case with all of the work that CAFC does, is to bring impact at a national or system wide level, and that of course is is the um, that's part of our mandate. We certainly do not have the um, um, the authority and or mandate to um, bring practice change at the provincial level. Um, hence, our reason for um, speaking about and 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 uh, uh, strengthening our partnership with Accreditation Canada because we feel that nationally that is a way that we can support 
um, the need for practice change and support the implementation of that change. Um, of course, there would be a provincial impact, but our view or our lens, if you will, um, must remain at that uh, national or systems level. I hope that uh, sort of addresses, at least in part, the question. All right, the uh, next question um, that's being asked is, what are the obstacles for accreditation? And he goes on to say, I assume that it is through the CMA, and I, I'm not sure if Peter's thinking about uh, the CMA's accreditation of, pro of training programs like such as for paramedics and other professions. That we're referring to accreditation by Accreditation Canada, which is uh, a body that accredits uh, organizations, so health service organizations, hospitals, and children's treatment centers, and EMS, EMS yeah. and, and at the service delivery level, as opposed to accrediting individual practitioners. Right. Kate, do you have any? any no, idea? no, I think that, that, that summarizes that. Yeah, it does. But as far as the obstacles for accreditation with Accreditation Canada, I mean, that's, you know, again, that's, that's something that we've talked about at the systems design group and I think at the steering group as a whole in that the service models are so different from province to province. It's, it's going to be a challenge to come up with one accreditation process for, for all of them and in, in the sense that some teams are based in hospitals, some are provincial teams, some are separate from the hospital. So who do you accredit? Do you accredit the hospital? Do you accredit the team? So there are definitely some obstacles and challenges when it comes to Accreditation Canada and accreditation, getting an accreditation program in place. Again, if, if, I can, um, if I can speak to that, just, just to continue that dialogue for a moment, I think as a, as a community, and, and I want to embrace and include everybody on today's webinar as being part of our community, um, in working in this way, in this collaborative way, I think we have an opportunity, first of all, to influence, a very, and I say that very respectfully, to influence a very important process. If from your feedback, your input, um, just your participation today, and we can feel the, the, um, the, the passion behind that, if we can bring your expertise and recommendations to Accreditation Canada, specific to some of these recommendations, that's making a very, very strong statement, if you will, and bringing the voice of our experts to an empowering body like Accreditation Canada so that we do have the opportunity to, pra to change practice and to strengthen our teams and to strengthen the transport system, if you will, um, for uh, interfacility transport across the country. So I, I do think that, yes, it, it's, it's, not, it's never easy, but this process of going to the content experts first, putting a strong methodology in place in developing these recommendations, and then working all the while with Accreditation Canada um, throughout this process, I really think will enable um, the sort of national standards at the at the end of this. And there was just a clarification coming about that question about uh, the New Brunswick NICU mm -hmm. transport team. Apparently they used to have one and they no longer have a designated NICU team. And, and she was in fact wondering if we were aware if there was anything happening in this area. And, and I, I don't think I don't think we know. I, don't, I know we, us at Gavs, we don't really know if there's any plans to re-implement an NICU transport team in New Brunswick. All I can say is that that there is an agreement with uh, Life Flight through Nova Scotia to provide neonatal transport. So that's how it's currently done. Okay. And the other question is uh, around: Were any of the territories, the Yukon Northwest Territories or, or Nunavut, included in the document to date? I think the, um, in terms of individuals on our steering committee from, from those areas, uh, no, um, there, there, there was no one representative. However, um, I think that a number of our um, organizations in the country, in fact, support uh, communities uh, that are represented within our territories, um, and, uh, and I, I think that Again, there um, we are hoping that this document in its draft form will in fact reach 
our colleagues in, 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 in our northern community so that in fact we can have their feedback and input into this process. And if you have any specific individuals and or organizations, I'm not sure, Doug, if we know who's, uh, who asked that question. That's Penny who's asked that question. Penny, if, if, you, you know, if you have specific individuals and or organizations that you would like to introduce us to so that we can ensure they're a part of this process, that would be very, very helpful. And I, and, I, and I think, again, that, you know, this work, this specific piece of, the, of our broader work in transport, it, you know, we didn't address that with this particular profile. However, the systems design group is in the pro, has a process that they've laid out where they're planning to survey both transport teams to get more information. Our previous surveys were m much more high level as far as, you know, what's your general team makeup, how many transports do you do, what type of training in general do you provide, it was very high level. And we were, we're looking to get more information in that area, more, much more detailed information from transport teams, but also from the, the referring bodies. So going out to the people who are contacting transport teams and requesting that a patient be transported to a tertiary center. So that's where we have had some discussions about how we would connect uh, directly with uh, those folks in rural and remote areas that are the referring centers. And those questions would be more along the lines of getting almost, not necessarily a satisfaction survey, but, but getting a sense of what the experience is like as a referring center in how easy is it to contact the team, is the process mm -hmm. clear, is the, what are the response times like from the ref referring center's perspective and that sort of thing. So there, there is certainly some uh, work in progress to connect with not just people in the territories, but all of the rur rural and remote centers that are referring patients to transport teams to be transported to tertiary centers. And I think that's, uh, that's all the questions that we had come in and uh, we are about 10 minutes over time so uh, I think we're probably going to wrap it up now. I'm just going to hand it over to Elaine for some final comments here. Wonderful Doug, thank you so much for facilitating. Um, without, without your leadership this, this doesn't happen. Um, Kate, I want to say thank you to you again for a wonderful, wonderful presentation and, and really reflecting our intentions as well as the work that's been done to date. I want to emphasize the importance of your participation on today's webinar and the questions have been outstanding and, and already so very helpful in helping us to move this work forward. I would really encourage you, um, I think it's fair to say that everyone who's participated today will receive an email with the link to the survey uh, monkey tool that, um, that we shared with you on today's webinar. In addition, again, we'll repeat the link to our Knowledge Exchange Network um, where you can access the practitioner profile. If you could take that few minutes to sort of just think about today's presentation, review the document, and bring us your feedback. Um, we really need that input and your expertise to take us to the next steps. And in, in just adding a little bit more to one question that was um, asked earlier in terms of next steps, this, this ongoing consultation process will take us through the next several months, and then we will invite everyone who participated on our various webinars back to, um, a, we'll call it a, a, a deliverable um, event where we will share and bring the next version and what we hope will be the final version. So we're going to, going to keep our community well informed of our progress. And uh, on that note, I, I want to once again thank everyone for their participation. I want to recognize the leadership of our practitioner profile working group as well as our national steering committee. Without, without your expertise and leadership, CAFC could not be doing what we're doing in this area. And, um, and we'll officially close the webinar. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thanks,